Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Kim Dorman. I, and also, thank you for waiting. We were having way too much fun back there. Um, so uh, we are delighted to have you. My name is Kim Dorman. I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for the Princeton Public Library. And really, I'm just here to uh, orient you to the Zoom space. For uh, those of you who are still feeling a little bit uncomfortable, I want to make sure you know that um, at the bottom, you can just select live transcript, which I'm going to um, enable now, and you can enable that for yourself, and it will um, then offer a live transcript of what the speakers are saying at the bottom. Uh, we are always delighted to partner with Paul Robeson House uh, to offer wonderful programming, and also with Dr. Joy Barnes Johnson, uh, who is just a wonderful human, and is going to introduce this evening's program. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Well, it is my absolute delight to welcome Sharon Rudolph, an author and illustrator for one of what I think is the most important books about Paul Robeson's life called Ballad of an American um, last year. It was my pleasure to develop a study guide um, during the African American uh, Heritage Month that allowed us to sort of bring the words and the, the artwork of Sharon Riddle to the community, including our racial literacy students. At the Princeton High School and in the Princeton Public Schools, we have a delightful um, program that allows us to invite students to be parts of conversations. But now that I am working with the Paul Robeson House of Princeton, we are working to sort of bridge some of the gaps that are created because of the pandemic. One of the things that we get a chance to do tonight is have one of our leaders of color for change, Taylor Faith McGee, who was a student in the racial literacy program at Princeton Public School, and Sharon Ruddall in conversation with each other. I am going to be in the background, making sure that um, if there is any thing that needs to happen, I can sort of support that. But we thank both Sharon and Taylor Faith and look forward to the wonderful program this evening. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Hi, Taylor. <laughs> Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so yeah. I got your, your questions if you wanted to base anything on those or just wing it is also good. Great. Um, let me just try to get this presentation up. Are you able to see it? It says leaders of color for change, cradling a tire and tiny flame conversation with Sharon Rudolph. Is it but I, that's and I see something that looks like a, a key opening in a door. Yes, ma'am, that is perfect. So this is our presentation um, for Locke Leaders of Color for Change, Cradling a Tiny Flame Conversation with Sharon Rudolph. And thank you for coming once again. Thank so, you for having me. <laughs> So I'm just going to introduce um, you, if that's okay, and you can introduce yourself as well. So Miss Sharon Rudolph, comic artist, illustrator, writer, and revolutionary. Miss Rudolph is a comic illustrator and writer who has used her platform to advocate for social justice. Her activism on human rights has revolutionized the comic community through her work, such as Ballad of an American, a graphic biography of Paul Robeson, and her short film, Two Marches. She has paved the way for female comic illustrators and is notably one of the founders of the feminist wing for the underground comics movement. With a past of marching alongside the world's most prominent civil rights activists, such as Martin Luther King, Rudolph has dedicated her artistry to the cause for gender and racial equality. So if you would like to introduce yourself more formally, um, more informally, you may. Well, I, I just like to also mention um, my graphic 
biography of um, of Evan Goldman is something else I'm very proud of having having done that came out in 2007. But you know, I've also done science fiction and uh, stories about um, Jewish history, and I don't entirely limit myself to political topics. But but I do always limit myself to something I feel good about doing. I don't ever accept work that I don't feel good about doing. One of the things I love that Paul, Paul Robeson said was that in a, in a capitalist country, he charges as much as he can. And in a socialist country, he works for free. And I, I take it some, something of a similar attitude when it comes to accepting work. If I, if I love it enough, I'll, I'll find a way to do it. And if I, if I just barely think it's OK, then I, I expect to be remunerated. That's what's important. And your passion has changed like the history of comics. So thank you for that. So um, is it okay if I ask you some questions about your career and your passion? Sure. I mean, I don't promise to remember everything at this point, but I'll do my best. I'm 74 years old, by the way, and starting to feel it after two years of the pandemic. I mean, going into the pandemic, I still felt like, oh, this being old is great. The police don't bother you as much. And I wasn't having any problems. But now I am starting to feel sort of worn down. Just, I think it's more not being able to get around and do all the usual things I do and not just the time passing. But anyway, you can try asking and I'll try remembering. <laughs> So um, firstly, when did you know that comic illustration and writing was your passion? Well, I went to art school. I went to an all, all scholarship art school in New York City called Cooper Union in the mid 1960s. And at that time, all the art was like paintings were either all black or all white and the and sculptures were like metal cubes and, and artists that were getting really successful in gallery art were doing things like painting the stripes that go down the middle of streets. And it was very, very frustrating. All the things I had hoped to learn and wanted to do didn't seem to be expressed in, in the art world as it was then. And when I got out of getting out of college, graduating out of college was actually one of my more traumatic experiences because here I had, you know, all this knowledge and all this ability and I, the jobs I tried to get, none of them, none of them seemed to actually do anything for me. They weren't actually accomplishing what I wanted to do. And then I was, I was in um, Madison, Wisconsin because my first husband was there as a graduate student and it, it was much more like a small town experience than being in New York. And um, people around me discovered that I was an artist and they came over to where I was living and said, our, our friend, our comrade is in jail. We need a poster for bail to raise money for bail. You're going to do it. And I think that was actually a, the step that I took that I never looked back. And then we all started a newspaper together, this group of, of left wing friends called Takeover. Uh, it was sort of, it had a lot of humor in a sort of Saturday Night Live way, but it was also extremely radical. And uh, doing that, I first started doing things that were like comics, like maybe panels and uh, imitation of advertising and stuff. And then when I moved to San Francisco, I worked for an underground newspaper called The Good Times. And that did have some actual comics. And there was a cartoonist there named Guy Caldwell, who is a very fine revolutionary artist, still working. And uh, he served time in jail for refusing to go fight in, in Vietnam. And he took he did something that still sticks with me that's really interesting, that he, took, he made a color fast. He said he wouldn't work in color again until the war ended. So he was drawing comics. I used to watch and think, you know, could I ever do that? And that's what I really want to do. And then just when all that was sort of coming to an end and, and there was no longer enough interest to keep the underground newspapers alive and there was a lot of repression from the, the government, um, Trina Robbins, who had um, put together the women's comic called It Ain't Me Baby, decided she wanted to start a serious collective women's comic that would be called women's comic. And she actually went around trying to find women to work on it. And she came to the Good Times offices and uh, said, would anyone here like to draw comics? Any, any women here like to draw comics? Like, I want to draw comics, I want to draw comics. And that was, that was the beginning and I've never looked back. It really is the perfect medium for me it, it, because I'm able to combine all the different things that I like to do. And I mean, I, th I know I'm a pretty good writer but I don't really want to write a whole book. But, and I, and I know I'm, I can write scripts and I can come up with great visual ideas, but I could never really deal with the, the, the politics and the, the money and the whatever else to try to get into television or movies. It's like being able to be your own entire movie department, just sitting at home with a pencil and a piece of paper. You invent the costumes and you, the characters and you write the script and you decide what, what the action's gonna be and you're able to add whatever mood 
that lighting or music or, you know, the only thing I think I, I regret about comics is you can't have music. And I really would have loved to include a CD of Paul Robeson singing with every copy of the book. If I had really had my druthers and had the power to ask for something like that, that would have been the one thing I would have done is that everybody that bought the book would also have a CD of him singing. Wouldn't that have been good? That would have been really good, I think. That's what's wanted. great about your film, um, Two Marches, your short film. You really I didn't get actually do that. I did the art for it. And then the person that I had done the art for, this um, retired sociology professor that that works on the various progressive projects. Um, he he had a, he paid a, a studio to, to have me record the narration. And I thought, well, nothing will ever happen with that. And then he hired somebody else to animate it and started sending it around to film festivals. And I didn't really have anything to do with anything except creating the original art and narration. But I think, it, can you guys play it? I think it turned out pretty well and it's a pretty good introduction to my life and times. Yes, we're going to be playing it um, shortly. I just have one more question, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I just wanted to ask, what inspired you to use your art as a platform for social activism? Well, I mean, that's almost not the right question, because I always used any opportunity, anytime I was given any pages, you know, in a, in a publication, I always used it to do what was most important to me. And, and I guess a lot of that always has been what now gets the head of social activism. But for me, it's just struggling, struggling to express. There's actually something I, I is this a good time to like, there's something in all these different interviews and talks and everything. There was one of the things I thought I wanted to talk about sometime I'd never gotten around to that. It, would this be a good time or should we wait till later? Oh, no, you can share it with us right now. Okay. So everybody, everybody knows about post-traumatic stress disorder, right? Something horrible happens to you, especially when you're young. And then if you hear a sound like that, or somebody reaches for you, it's almost impossible to really get over your reaction. You, there's various things you can try to do, but it's very difficult. Well, I think there's something that's the opposite. When I was very young, all the true facts about World War II and the Holocaust and Hiroshima were just beginning to come out. And I would hear planes going overhead and think we were going to be bombed. And, and you know, there no and the newspapers and uh, even President Kennedy thought it was perfectly normal that we would have a nuclear war that would kill everybody. The, the slogan of the government at the time was better red than dead. And red wasn't wasn't um, Republican then, red meant communist like Paul Robeson. And, and, you know, it's like they wanted to kill my, I guess that's how climate activists feel now. You guys want to kill my whole generation. What are you up to? You know, and I felt like I was the only person that experienced those things and thought those things. And then there was, I heard on the radio that there were students coming down. I was maybe in eighth grade coming down from New York and New Jersey and places like where you are that were going to demonstrate it in Washington, D.C. at the White House against atmospheric nuclear testing. And at that time, we were just sending off nuclear bombs every which way. And there was there was strontium 90, 90, there was radioactivity in mother's milk. I mean, we were we were being killed for this completely artificial idea of commies bad, capitalist good. And so I heard that there were people coming down to demonstrate. And this was the first demonstration at the White House in more than 10 years, because under McCarthy and under the anti-red, the same people that crushed Paul Robeson, people were afraid, afraid to even like walk in the streets and carry picket signs. So we're talking like the real early 60s. And I, and I skipped school and took a bus and went down and I found people that agreed with me, people that saw and thought and felt the same things I did. And, and every time I would go out, there would be more of them and more of them and more of them. And we would march together and things changed, things happened, laws were written, you know, it actually did something. And having all that, I mean, I admit so much wasn't as much as we expected it to be. And so much was rolled back. And there's so many disappointments and there's so many fights that have to be refought against racism for women's equality, for everything. But I mean, we ended the draft. It wasn't until I was pregnant with my first child that men even had to register for the draft again. We ended the death penalty. I mean, we, 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 allowed, we had voting rights, which are now being taken away. We, it, was, it was the experience that if you believe something and you go out and join other people that believe it, you can actually do something. And I had that at such an early age, at such a formative age, I'll never recover. I'll never be able to be entirely cynical. I'll never be able to feel completely hopeless. When I heard the voices chanting for George Floyd, I put on my mask and I dragged myself out into the street. So I can never give up. And I think, really yeah, no, but Sharon, I think one of the things that is so absolutely beautiful about what you just said is this. And so it's it's a theme, uh, the, the 
cradling a tiny flame and the idea that it takes individuals forming a greater collective to actually see change and the process of incremental change, which leads to monumental change. And so when I think um, about what, what Taylor Faith has, right? So if Taylor Faith is one generation, I'm another generation and you are the generation before me, then what's really exciting about even this opportunity right now is that Taylor Faith is, is the extension, right? So she is the part that's carrying the flame and it's 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 boiling over. So Taylor Faith, I'm I'm curious to know. We're counting on you, Taylor Faith. You got yeah. so <laughs> what how 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 do you anticipate us, that is the generations that came before you, to keep your light uh lit? What do we do? Honestly, just support. There's a lot, um, what I have observed in the past, um, like my mentors such as you are very supportive. However, um, some older generations um, take issue to the progression that we are making um, because it goes against a lot of traditions, um, especially in such a traditionalist America. So all I ask for is just support and you've been amazing, so thank you. Yeah, I mean, so, so Sharon, I was thinking about what you were just saying about climate, right? And oh, well. climate change. Oh yeah. And no, so, I think for her generation, that's what nuclear holocaust was to my generation. Yeah. Right. You all and are we, trying to kill me. I got to do something about it. I don't have any choice. It's a life or death issue. But I think that's I think that's it. And so when I stop and think about Paul Robeson, for example, and how he was like something's got to give and how he left, how he left the United States, how he left Princeton, how he left even um, what he was planning to do. He was, he was planning to be a lawyer and he was hoping to change the world using his art form. And so I think that's why you are so important. I think about Taylor Faith too, because I want to hear, I want to hear Taylor Faith, like, how do you plan and change the world? Because when I think about Paul Robeson, I said, you know, he started out being excellent. He was an excellent student. He was an excellent scholar, just like you, right? Um, and he was like, he went to law school and was like, I think I will go further with my art. And that's where I see Sharon, right? Your, your art speaks for you in these magnificent ways and the choices that you make. So, I'm like, and then I look at me. But I don't think it's adequate. No matter how good the art is, I think people have to work together. And they have to, I, like the Occupy movement was so brilliant, but the idea that you can just, you have these 24 hour day meetings and everything has to be consensus. If we don't organize, our enemies will organize and defeat us. That said something else I have to, to your generation, Taylor Faith. If we don't <laughs> actually be realistic about what we can accomplish and have a plan, then our enemies will defeat us because they, they will organize. True. So what do you say to that, Taylor? <laughs> no, I totally, I totally agree, especially if we're talking about a government that for decades has been used to oppress its people and not just talking about people of color, but even um, white people as well, because the a lot of them are like blinded to the systemic oppression of people of color. So in that way, they're being manipulated as well. Well, the big, um, the big thing, the taboo in this country, it's people can talk about race, they can't talk about class. And that's a really important how people get crushed in this country. And then something like, you know, West Virginia and Joe Manchin, what they, the little sop that they give the white lower classes, yeah, but you're still better than the colored lower class. And that's, that's what they're living on. But you got to defeat, you got to defeat this class distinction. You can't yeah, just go with, don't you agree with me? Exactly. And I think that too is a, is a Robeson principle. Robeson right? really copped to all that. And he worked with everybody. See, I knew that when he was young, I don't remember whether it's W. E. Du Bois or somebody else, but there was this idea at the turn of the 20th century of, of colored people that uh, the talented tenth, that if you could get this tenth of the people that were educated, were able, were useful, then people would respect black 
And at some point, Paul Robeson just decided, no, that's not good enough. We have to work together to make real concrete practical change. And, and something I did in the book, I kept asking the people that I was working with, my editors, but what made him change? What made him change? And they actually weren't clear on that. So I did, there I did a little bit, you know, take artistic license that I wanted to have it actually be that he at some point had like an inspiration that he had to do this, that he had to reach out and work with other people. And then that's what he did the rest of his life. He worked for every, every pub, well, and Australians and every anytime he saw oppression, anytime he saw injustice, that was that was where he would be donating his time and his money and his effort to, to try to work against it. I think that this is the perfect segue into my next question. And it's your graphic novel about Paul Robeson covers so much of his life. How did you research for the project? OK, I took notes on your questions. Um, I, I read everything I could get my hands on, and I have a good relation with my uh, local librarian because I always go in there and hang out and read the newspaper. And uh, he took out some books for me, but the, the very most um, magisterial book about Robeson's life is by somebody named Duberman, Professor Duberman. I actually don't remember his first name. It's like a thousand pages. And boy, I didn't get through it all, but I like underlined stuff and I got a lot of, and he had really good footnotes and I was able to use that. And a much shorter book that I think was actually more useful was the um, Robeson, Robeson um, for Beginners by Professor Von Bloom, who's a professor at UCLA, not so far from me. So I've, I've talked to him since and he wrote a review of the book. And I read Robeson's own book. Let's see. Where did you ask what books? His own book is Where Here I Stand, Here I Stand by Paul Robeson, which is actually very, I mean, he says a lot about what he thinks. It's a short book. He says a lot about what he feels, but he does sort of tell the stories about his, his youth and stuff in a way that he makes them entertaining and they make good comics the way he told them. He's already done the preliminary work of making them be interesting stories. So you never know 100% whether something like that's true. But I can't, this is part of my whole way of working that I use with Emma Goldman too. I decide if, if it's somebody's uh, biography that I'm doing, they get, to, they get to tell the story the way they want to tell it. So I'm not going to question what they have to say. And they get to be taller than they were. I didn't do that with Paul because he was already so tall. But I made Emma taller and they can be handsomer than they were. Well, of course, I can't do that with Paul Robeson either. You can't be much more handsome than that but basically you know he, he gets he gets to be in charge I don't try to pull him down whereas Duberman see I got sort of annoyed with that book it turned out it spent too much time just talking about what famous people he hung out with and how important he was or he wasn't and and it was sort of need like I know gossipy in a way that didn't it didn't really even though it was a useful book to me I do have my quarrels with it so um that's basically what I did and you you asked about my method and my method is is um I, I underline if it's a book that I got cheap online and I can underline it, I underline it. If it's a library book, I won't underline it. And then I take lots and lots and lots of notes. And I always do my best work when I'm just walking around going to Trader Joe's or something. I, I just think things. And sometimes I stop and sit on a wall and write stuff on the corner of my newspaper and come home and work on it. So it's notes. And then at some point, it's something like an outline. And I didn't do that till I was like middle-aged. But they always tell you in high school, you should make outlines. And they're right. It works out much better if you make it outline. So then I mean, the outline is more like sort of a rough map of how, how is this going to go? And when I first was doing it, I actually thought of a completely different map that I'd have it take place during a performance of Othello, which was like his signature role and also a really symbolic metaphoric role for his role in society. But I started taking notes from the Shakespeare and I realized, no, that's just not going to do it. It's going to be too narrow cast and it's not going to include a lot of things about his life that are important. So I threw that idea out and then I just sort of, and I also, I mean, one of the wonderful things about comics that are sort of like underground comics is you, there's a lot of leeway. So a real motivation is I really want to tell this story. I'm going to tell this story. It isn't always whether this story actually leads to the point that you're supposed to be making. It might just be that it's that it's a story that really resonates with you or that you really feel is important to share with people because you love it so much. So that motivates me. So you've got your notes, you've got your outline. And then the next thing is I actually do write scripts, just like they were movie scripts. Partly this time I did that even more carefully because I had to get them okayed by my editors and by the people that the production staff person at Rutgers. And I, I very little got censored. Just uh, one of the only things that got censored is in the demonstration in Provincetown where people don't want Paul Robeson to act in a play with a white woman. Um, I had them uh, carrying a picket sign that said, make America white again. And they wouldn't let me, they wouldn't let me make any Trump jokes. And uh, 
and there was and that when they was having the rise of fascism i'm going to use the word populism populist leaders and they didn't want me to do that for the same reason because i wanted to bring in like erdogan and modi and that horrible guy in hungary whose name escapes me and everything so it was only with sort of where i tried to make con contemporary comments that i got it you know thumbs down but otherwise they let me they really let me run with it and that's what i needed and um and then once I have that, have the go ahead and I have the script, then I just work, 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 work. It's really hard work. I can, and when I finish something like that, I can't imagine how I did it because I'm really a slow drawer and it's really hard for me. And if you could see the original pages, you see how much erasing there is and crossing out and putting white and doing it over. I mean, it's really torturous, but you know, when you're really motivated to do something, you do it. It's like taking care of a newborn baby or something. I think it's a lot like that, actually. It's like, it's crying, it's crying, you have to feed it. I mean, I just, you just do it, you know? It comes from someplace deep inside you that you have to do it. Yeah, I think it comes from your love of drawing and illustration. That's like your metaphor of it, like being a baby, like you have to nurture it, so. Yeah. Yeah, but also with something like the Wilson book, it's my it's my duty to him too to honor having had that project. I think due to everything that was going on politically, even at that time, I felt you know, do I have the right to do this as a white as a ostensibly white woman? I actually don't consider all the anti-Semitism lately as a real plus side for me that I can slide back from feeling white briefly because I was never white when I was growing up. I grew up in almost complete segregation of housing and recreation and schools and stuff as a Jew in the in the mid-Atlantic area. People don't remember that. You know, the school that the that Obama's daughters went to didn't accept Jews when I was when I was school age. It was only white Christians that went there. It well anyway, there's a lot that's changed in the world. But anyway, I sort of looked around when I was busy raising a family and found I'd been promoted to being white and it never really sat on my shoulders very comfortably. So I'm just as glad I got unpromoted and I can join all the other people that are oppressed again now. But I really was growing up. I mean, it was a very high level of segregation. All the, all the housing was uh, redlined against Jews, just as it was against Blacks. And um, there were quotas at all the higher education. It was, it was pretty strict and everybody just accepted it. I accepted it. Even when I first went out demonstrating for other things, I just accepted that there were those restrictions in the Jewish community. It's just something I had always lived with and thought was normal. So I think that opens, opens my heart a little bit to understanding the Black experience better than I would otherwise. That you can just normalize stuff that's really unjust if it's just what you grew up with and it's around you. Yeah. I think one of, as, as a racial literacy educator, that's one of probably the most profound things that we try to do is talk about how um, our codes for people, the human experience, uh, racial codes that we give is the construct itself and how it changed. What that means to, for race to be described as a social construct means that history and sociological imagination, AKA values, how we humanize or dehumanize people will change over time. And the political structure of um, our associations, how we find value, where we live, all of that um, really change it all. And so the, the interest convergence element of these conversations about what is acceptable race and racialized presence. Um, I, I just love the way that you describe the need to re-examine class and caste as a I think that's really important in the U.S. I think that's the dirty secret of how U.S. society is arranged, that we don't fess up to that the way people maybe in some European countries do, that the workers are going to fight against the bosses or whatever for us. That's, race has been a way to divide us and make it easier for our, for our oppressors to oppress us. I really think it's been used that way in the U.S. Yeah, and so one of the things that we first thought about at the um, as a committee, the Paul Robeson House, um, program committee, we first thought about is honoring the Spingarn Medal, which was awarded in 1944 to Paul Robeson. And so here's this idea of, of recognition for this powerful work, and then to see just a few years later how it would all go away. All the notoriety, all the, the wonderful work that had been done would sort of be um, taken from Mr. Robeson. And it's like, so here we go. Let's let's talk about all of the, the 
things that are happening right now that deserve merit, or maybe they don't. I'm not sure. What do you think about um, rewards and recognition? What's that? What does that mean in our rewards and recognition? And I well, I mean, I think it always makes people feel good when they're recognized, you know, so I mean, if it goes to somebody that can use some encouragement, I think that's more important than yet another award for somebody that's already gotten zillions of awards. What is it that the something the genius fellowships, I forget what they're called, but they're given to people that haven't reached that high in their careers to give them a chance to do more. I think I think that could be a good thing that even a little recognition if you haven't gotten much can give you some make you feel better make you feel like you're willing give you more motivation to continue your work but i think a lot of the biggest awards are always given to the you know like the, the people that get awards just keep getting more awards i don't think there's much use to that that would be all i'd have to say about that if anybody wants to give me an award at this point hey i'm not going to turn it down <laughs> I have one question that um, is specific to the misogyny that um, goes, that takes place within the comic community. So I wanted to ask you, um, the comic community has a history of being male dominated. Can you recall any instances where your capabilities were questioned due to misogyny? Oh, I think until always, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, it, there were the little publishing groups that joined to put out the alternative comics and underground comics were all men, and they were always very, by and large, with just a few exceptions, they were scornful of women, and it was very, very hard for a woman artist to get her work in any of the, the men's books. I mean, I was lucky enough that a, a few admitted me, but it, it was always an uphill battle. It's actually easier to work with stuff like academic publishers than it, or mainstream publishers than it ever, progressive publishers than it ever was to work with the, within the comic circle. A, an exception, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Spain Rodriguez, who was also a progressive left-wing cartoonist. He started out doing this great comic in New York City in the, the early 60s called uh, Trash Man. He was, he was a, a Latino trash man who would turn into a revolutionary hero. Anyway, it turns out Spain was very welcoming and very helpful to the women artists. And it turns out his mother was a professional painter who supported the family. So that, you know, he, he was brought up, his mother's milk, as it were, brought him up to be able to respect women artists. But he was a real exception. Very, very few of them were, were they'd look at the women artists and just, you know, talk about their appearances or something, or that they might be easy romantic conquests or whatever. Very hard to, but I don't know. I mean, I have to say one of my useful qualities in whatever it is I've accomplished is I am awfully stubborn. And and growing up, having nobody around me agree with what I thought or liked or believed at all, it, it's kind of habituated me to, to not being, you know, I don't need people to be supportive for me to feel that it's that I should keep doing what I think it's right to keep doing. So I did kind of learn that the hard way. Well, I'm thankful for your stubbornness because it has made a huge impact <laughs> on many communities. Thank you so much. Thank you know, you. it's very hard to be in an, to be in an environment that is just against your like your passion so you're facing um like you're being persecuted because you're a woman as well as being jewish as well as fighting for equality in regards to gender and race and then you're also channeling that into your art like that's <laughs> like your story actually is so just interesting to me and i'm so intrigued by that because of the many layers of just challenges that you went through. And then you just continue to do that, especially for it's such a It's still a challenge to have an outlet. I mean, since I finished the ropes and, you know, I sort of cast it out to the people I knew that might hire me. And, and you know, I did get the job doing the um, illustrations for the, the William Morris book, with, which I'm very happy with. But now that's done. You know, I, I actually was out of work again. And I still feel, even though I felt almost ready to retire before I did the ropes, and now I feel like, well, whatever work I have left in me, I want to do it. So I contacted the same person who commissioned um, the two marches. I said, well, you know, I'm out. I finished my last job. Do you have any ideas? And he's doing something about disability rights. So I was that he wants me to do art for. So that's, you know, that's something I've never really addressed that I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to address. So that's, that's going to be the next thing I do. But as I say, even now, when I, with all the things I've had published, it's still very, very hard to find a, a book that's going to be, you know, put adequately published that people, it's on paper and people see it and whatever that, I mean, I could, I suppose I could probably just do stuff, 
you know, that I put out myself, but as far as something that's actually going to come out, it's still very hard for me to find work. That's a very interesting topic. I feel like social activism and civil rights is constantly evolving, like that definition, because I feel like talking about like disability rights is very um, modern because yes. people with disabilities were outcasted. I didn't even notice for decades. And centuries, actually, centuries. centuries. Yeah. I mean, when you read even great old literature, when they refer to someone that's crippled or something, they're just, you know, like an object, they're not treated as humans at all. I think the interesting thing about it, this is going to be quotes from actually disabled people saying what they want other people to know. And then I'm going to illustrate them with little cart graphic vignettes. So I'm really looking forward to it because it, I'm 74 years old now and various things don't work as well as they used to. So it occurs to me that disability in a way is, is the only protected category that we almost all enter at one time or another. I mean, if you're fortunate enough to reach an advanced age, if you have a difficult pregnancy, you know, if you're having an accident, it, very few people don't at one time or another see what it's like to not have the use of some of their base, not to be able to walk easily or not to be able to see well or not to be able to hear well or have to, or be physically fragile. Most of us will have that experience at one time or another, but we don't, we'd rather not think about it. So that seems very, like a very interesting thing for me to, to start trying to understand more and, and channel, I'll be channeling with disabled activists. People want to actually tell the rest of us, what do you want to tell people who are not disabled? What do you want them to know? And that's what I'm supposed to be illustrating. So I'm actually very excited about that. It seems like the perfect project for me at this point. But it, you know, it, people don't come running to my door or offering to publish stuff by any means, even at this point. Sorry to say, it's still a battle. That's unfortunate. <laughs> They're missing out most definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so someone from the audience wants to know, um, did you see or have any contact with Paul Robeson? I'm not old enough to have, to, I guess maybe as a really little kid I might have done, but he was already uh, in very reduced health himself by the time I would have been old enough to, to even meet him at a, a meeting or something. So no, I never did. But oh, you asked me one of your questions that I listened to his music. And yes, that was one of the most, I think that was more helpful than any books. I went to this place called Amoeba Records that that's, uh, they were closed down a lot during the pandemic and they've moved, but they're back in business, but they were still open and I got lots of old CDs, secondhand CDs with Paul Robeson singing. And whenever I'd actually be sitting and drawing, I would I would put it, his, him on so that his voice actually, both because I wanted to learn from it and be touched by it, but he, then it turned out he really sustained me. There's, especially there's a song, Bomb and Gilead, and he, it's, sometimes I feel disheartened and think my work's in vain. And yeah, I would hear him sing that. And then the verses later that, but you know, it's okay. You, there is a Bomb and Gilead and you, you will be able to stand up and do your work again. And that really got me through some of the, Paul Robeson actually saw me through some of the times that I most would have to just throw the whole thing out the door and not even try to work on it anymore. He was, it was very important to listen to him singing. Wow. Another question um, from someone in the audience is, can you talk more about finding women artists along your journey who are working in the protest vein? Um, well, once I was working on women's comics, uh, I actually became a roommate of a couple of a, a woman artist named Trina Robbins, who's become, she doesn't draw anymore, hasn't for some decades, but she still writes stuff that comes out in the graphic medium. And she is a historian of women artists and cartoonists brought out a number of books. And we had a whole cooperative co-op of women artists that worked together and discussed each other's work and stuff. <clears throat> and since then, it's more just like who I contact through other women that I already know. There's a woman who was a, one of the cartoonists who's a muralist in LA that I'm still in contact with. And another one of the first artists lives in um, Joshua Tree in the desert, but she does things like, you know, designing t-shirts and stuff. I mean, people do all sorts of different things, but they're still artists and I do stay in touch with some of them. But I can't say I have a really firm network of, of women graphic artists now. That's really interesting because I feel like that um, community has grown and expanded since your generation. And I would, I would believe that they would kind of like gravitate toward you, especially since you have this extensive history within the community. Well, you're welcome to give anybody my contact information. I mean, I do occasionally, I, I have stuff in a bunch of shows where people contacted me. There was a um, women artist show that traveled around Europe and was in the Vienna Secession Gallery. And there was a show that traveled 
in England, and then it was in Israel that a woman, an artist from England, put together that I just, she actually just sent me something in the mail, which was actually a, a tribute drawing of me by another woman artist. So I'm not saying there's no contact, but I don't feel like I have a, a particular international group of women artists now that I that say in, in touch, but I'd be delighted to meet more. That would be great. I'd love to. If you know anybody who'd be interested in being in touch, I'd love to. I actually know a few. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Artists tend to be, they do tend to be kind of isolated people, though, I have to say, even of some of the male artists I've known have been very successful, because it's just work that you do by yourself in a very concentrated way. So you, you don't go out and socialize as much in some ways. So I think that is part of it. Like the old expression, herding cats. We tried to form an underground cartoonist union and it was it was really a laugh riot because nobody would agree about anything. And, and we made all terrible mistakes in ordering bad materials and we finally just gave up and dissolved. So, I mean, that's why I say organization matters because I've never been any good at it. So anybody that isn't any good at organize, organizing, please get to work, organize. Whether it's art or revolution, you need organization. What I've observed with um, artists that I know personally is that their artistry is very personal and they're actually very reluctant to share it. So it's-, it's That's a, a natural tendency. I mean, someone like Paul Robson, a performing artist, their art is, is something that they give out to other people and they're energized by other people's response. People that draw or write or something along those lines, it, it, it is very private and personal usually. Yeah, that that there was a comment in the the questions that talked about how complicated Paul Robeson is was as a human being and sort of this concept of a always a need to bend the moral arc. And I think that speaks directly to um, what you're describing as well, right? The idea that the moral arc bends um, toward justice and the fact that you wanted to capture that. Um, in this storytelling, I think is powerful. So there was a different question in the um, audience that asked this, it talks about science fiction and it says science fiction has been used to express political views, especially in places where that expression is suppressed. Have you used your science fiction or have you used yes. science fiction? Yes, my one solo comment book was called Adventures of Crystal Night and it's it's you know it's a science fiction adventure but it's about uh getting rid of the, the uh cartels of of international commerce that are oppressing people and devastating the environment and such it's straight I love political science fiction I think that's one of the best things you can do with it and even some of the shorter science fiction stories I've done have always been along those lines when I do science fiction it's definitely the dystopia that must be overturned and I have a good time with that yeah, so there's this new, there's, there, there's one new one that just came out, like uh, Dune, and then I see in the chat, Octavia Butler. Do oh, she's you have great. a favorite, do you have a favorite novelist or- an Philip K. Or... Dick, Philip K. Dick. <laughs> but I read him a long time. I read him a long time ago when the world seemed, it seemed like he was really nailing what the world was like, you know, at some time in the 70s particularly, I think. He, he nails it the way it is now too, though, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I think that's the interesting thing. So uh, I'm 51 or will be 51. And so the, this idea that people that were writing this dystopic or even utopia, utopic, utopia, wrote about utopia or dystopias, um, like Octavia Butler, like, um, I don't know, uh, my brain is farting right now. And you say, man, and I look and I see how much of this science fiction mirrored political narrative and how 50 and 60 and 70 years is still relevant. Oh, yeah. like, well, you got to remember the, the stuff, the writers that then they were, remember Twilight Zone? Twilight Zone was all political. It was all about, everyone's, every show was a political issue. And now, um, the black director did a, a couple seasons of it. I'm trying to steal, is his name steal the one that did us. Anyways, he did a, a year of science of Twilight Zone because he loved how political it was. And 
And the writers that mostly were used for that and the writers that wrote the science fiction pulps in the 50s and 60s that were so political, they got paid like pennies a word. They weren't like people that could have had some kind of job that they lived nice. So they stuck in all their feelings and all their griefs and all their complaints in the guise of science fiction. It's the people that are writing that are like people living in cold water walk-ups and stuff. They're not, they're not the people you think of as like successful writers. That's why this stuff's so good. <laughs> So there's something that the uh, proximity to poverty breeds imagination? Uh, maybe it just breeds the consciousness of injustice in the world. Mm. Yeah, I think I, I just watched a documentary about Pauli Murray that was fascinating. And it said because she felt like she was always in between worlds, she was able to see things that others couldn't see. That's and right. I wonder, I wonder if, if you, you feel the same. Well, I mean, if you think about it, somebody who's writing a science fiction script for some high powered studio and getting paid like zillions of dollars and surrounded by people who tell them how wonderful they are, no matter what they do and don't do, they're not going to see the world the same way as someone who's like scrabbling for their, their meals every day. You know, it's a different, it's a different world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Understood. There's another question um, in the audience. It says, you included the relationship between Robeson and Essie, but also other women who were interested in being part of this life. Another comic illustrator might have left those stories out. So talk about like the way you talk about the relationship between Robeson and Essie and the yeah. other. Yeah. So what were your thoughts? Can you well, I started out being just really impressed by her, her ability. She was one of the, the first black technical uh, worker at a, at a big hospital in New York. She was a lab technician. She could have been a doctor. Um, and she really made his career. I mean, I can come out and say that more than I would have said it in the book. I knew cartoonists like that. Um, um, the guy that did Mouse, it was actually his wife at the time that did all the contacting the agents and going around and knocking on doors and making things happen. The, the, the pairing of an artist man and his agent and his wife that really knows how to make things happen is a very powerful pairing. And that's one of the main disadvantages of the woman trying to make her way in the arts. Asses, you can't have that pairing. Essie was incredibly important, incredibly talented. Um, and he did, he loved her and was very devoted to her. And I think he lost his mother when he was very young. And I think there was a, a maternal feeling as well as a romantic feeling. Now, as far as his, his affairs with other women, most of them were rather casual. And um, I express in the book, I say, um, many people fell in love with Paul Robeson and he didn't always uh, resist temptation. And that's about all I wanted to say in that regard. I mean, it was a different time. People had a different attitude towards things like that. My impression, that's the sort of thing that Duberman, I think, goes into too much and in a too salacious way. My impression is by the standards of his time, he was a gentleman. You know, he didn't force himself on anybody. People were forever trying to seduce him. And most of his casual relationships were mutual friends that remain mutual friends. So, which has been true in my life too, to some extent, having lived through the 60s and 70s. I have, some of my best friends are people that I was romantically involved with many decades ago. It's a great basis for a friendship, to tell you the truth. But anyways, um, he had one relationship that he actually was talking about leaving Essie and, and marrying this woman. And his old coach from, uh, from Rutgers uh, talked him out of it. You know, uh, the true story will never be completely told. I only, I, I only know what I, what I found out, I tried to deal with it with um, discretion and with uh, kindness and with an open heart. Um, I don't think nowadays people would look at it the same way. I think they would think it was offensive that he undertook these kind of relationships. But I think at the time he was, within the normal range of gentlemanly behavior and, and behaved himself with kindness, certainly with kindness and consideration to all the people involved. And so, I tried to keep, I, I hope I, I handled that with, that seemed like something that did need to be handled with delicacy. Lots of grace granted. And I think actually I appreciated that because I think about my grandmother's generation I guess he would have been perhaps a little older than my grandmother. My grandmother was 98. And um, so in the end, when I think about it, it's like, yeah, the times were different. And so even your response right there was just incredibly gracious because I think that 
we try to interpret um, how people acted uh, in the 19th and 20th century with our 21st century mind, which is part of the problem. The value, the value in looking at histories and storylines is that there is humanity and all humans are in desperate need of grace. All humans are in desperate need of love and empathy. Um, and I think that Mr. Robeson was in, and his entire family, that's what he learned. He learned justice as an extension of empathy and not the, the loss of his mother um, created in him and in his entire family a different um, sort of foundation for, for service to humanity. And I think that's key. I think that's really important. So I want to put in the chat a link to the two marches because we don't actually have the rights to show it in the library. And so I'm hopeful that people okay. can march it. I, I, I'm really hopeful that people will um, watch it because Taylor Taylor Faith had a couple of questions because I think it's important. Again, you you use the two marches as bookends of a very important time frame of political thought, and I'm I'm like, holy mackerel! It, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. So I'll I'll mute myself. Go ahead, Taylor. I'm sorry. So people will be able to see it if they want to, though. There'll be a way they can get it. Okay. Absolutely. I put the link in the chat. To anyone, um, please, I invite you. It's a short, so it's maybe it's real minutes, short, <laughs> and it's it's a beautiful story. And hearing your voice, and man, I loved it. So, your short film Two Marches details your experiences of marching in pursuit of equality in the '60s and as recent as 2017. What troubles you about today's racial climate? Ah, well, the Virginia election troubles me. I mean, racism seems to be being used to, to keep the pigs in power, basically. It's a very old story, but lots of people feel they feel it's not just the pandemic. I mean, they feel their their work lives, it's inflation and and being uncertain about their work and being uncertain about being able to afford housing. And, you know, whenever people are, are worried about their security, that's when fanning racism is it, it, it's an old story you know whether it's it's burning down Jewish villages or burning down Chinatowns or burning down black communities you know this this is we're in this kind of time when it's the easiest thing to do you know don't blame us go blame this group you know rather than and they're getting away with it again and taking advantage of it I mean with everything that's going on and how much people are struggling you know, when you look at how much richer the rich have gotten these last few years, it's, I mean, I look, I can't look at the stock market figures anymore. I just want to vomit. It's just so disgusting. Yeah. Uh, no, they should send all the billionaires into space, but not let them come back, in my opinion, would be a good solution to a lot of things. Build enough rocket ships so you can let them all see. There, you've seen space. And then you just like, oh, sorry, we don't have a return fare for you. <laughs> that would be great. I'm no, not a I nice totally, person when it comes to stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> I totally agree with you on um, the placing blame on minorities because you saw that um, that's pretty much why the entire Holocaust happened because they needed somebody to blame World War I on. They blame it on the Jewish people as well as we see um, with um, COVID-19 bl blaming blame Asian. it on Asians. Yeah. And also when it comes to um, like the job market, then you want to blame Hispanic Black people immigrants. for taking jobs right. away, right? And when it comes, I mean, I think unions are really important, but it's also true. A lot of the traditional unions kept kept blacks out of their, their training programs and their apprenticeship programs. So that's you know, I want to see America reunionized, but reunionized in a racially just way. I don't think we'll have any progress as far as people's um, being able to have decent lives at all levels until they can have the power to, un Reagan really destroyed the unions. It's just, and it's gone on since then. It's like some really, the, when when there was a middle class, there were like, what is it? 30% of people belong to unions or something. Now it's like 5% or something. It's just, they don't, they don't have any way to represent their needs for decent pay. Yeah, it's a shame. So, with this conversation, um, what do you believe is the solution for social harmony, or at the very least, cultural tolerance? Hmm. You know, 
I don't, I, maybe I don't think cultural tolerance is as important as fighting for justice. I mean, there's lots of cultural tolerance now of, of like black art and black dance and black music and everything, but it hasn't made the lives of ordinary black people any better as far as getting decent jobs. So I, I, I think that, you know, I mean, tolerance is all very well, but I, th I think we should put our organizing, let's, let's say unions, unions and the equivalent of unions, there should be, um, women should organize to get pay, get pay or at least get uh, retirement for their household work, for their childcare, so that they're not left high and dry with nothing to live on when they're old. I mean, there's just so many practical matters that people need to address to have some level of, e of actual physical equality. And, let the and in some ways I feel like let the tolerance take care of itself. Let's take care of people's day-to-day -day lives not being treated so unequally and being so oppressed and being put in so much danger. Yeah, that's a very interesting take because um, from what I've observed, a lot of people believe that equality is just leveling the playing field where everyone just starts from ground zero. But from your take on it, it seems like for people that have been oppressed for generations and decades and centuries, that they should be able to get that leg up in order for there to be an equal playing field, if that makes any sense. I think they have to dig that playing field up entirely and build something completely different, ma'am. I just don't think it's been a usable playing field for my most of my lifetime. It's, 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 a, it's a playing field with like things for people to trip over and mines to blow them up and, you know, and with a special little bridge above for, the, for the, those from wealthy families that go to bribe Ivy League schools and all the rest of it. We're, we're like, I don't know, France before the, the French Revolution or something now. The degree of social and economic inequality is higher than it's been any time since even, it's worse than in the Gilded Age in the 1890s. It's when you actually look at the, at the numbers that as far as how most of the people live and what they have of power and wealth and property in the country and how small the group that controls almost everything is. We're at one of the, the worst times in history in spite of all our fantasies about what an equal country it is. Yeah, your um, topic of affirmative action is actually very interesting because um, I'm, I've just finished um, completing, completing my college applications and um, the question of affirmative action just has been ringing in my ears for these past few months. Um, and a lot of people think of affirmative action as benefiting minorities such as um, the LGBTQ plus community, um, Black people, um, Latinx um, people as well. Um, however, I just realized that affirmative action helps a lot of people whose grandparents sit on the boards of the schools or whose parents attended and grandparents, great grandparents right. attended colleges for centuries. But um, people like me, um, my mother is a first generation um, college student, um, my father as well. So I don't have that connection. Um, and it's very- unfair. I was the first college woman to go to a regular college in my family. The, the men, some of the men had gone, but I was the first woman. Yeah, I think it's got to be things like that. Again, let's, I'm getting back to class. I think I think we have the kind of class discrepancy that you had in like feudalism or something, and people are just you know, too, well, we don't have class in this country. We're all equal. We're not equal, and 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 it's it's it has to be dealt with in really structural ways. So I and I I'm not an expert on how that should be gone about. I'm just I'm good at getting out in the streets and demanding it. <laughs> I mean, knowledgeable people that know more about labor theory and economics and stuff have to actually figure out the program, but it's something it's we're going in a very bad direction in this country. Yeah, I think I think you have spotlighted, especially in thank you, Taylor. Thank you, Sharon, this idea that there are structural explanations, systemic reasons why we feel like we're on this treadmill and mobilizing beyond this moment um, is gonna mean actually going back and looking at past moments. How is it structured? And Paul Robeson was really, that's one of the things I love about his life and work. It, it wasn't just about one group or another being brought into the spotlight. It was everyone Absolutely. working together to have justice for everyone. You know? Absolutely. Justice yeah. for all. I right? love that about him. I just that's, love that that's about it. him. And, he and was a big enough man to see that and do that. Right. And, and the choice, ballot of an American, right? He was like, in this moment, I am an American and this is my song. And yeah. the song was designed to unite us all in this work. 
toward justice, toward freedom, right. liberty, right. all of that. Right. So, so Taylor, Taylor, you have shared so much of yourself. Sharon, you have shared so much of yourself in this conversation this evening. And so I'm wondering um, if, if you would say something to just walk us out so that we can continue to cradle this tiny light, this tiny flame that you share with us. And so I'll, I'll spotlight each of you. Just think for a moment and I will allow Taylor to um, give us the final say. So oh, should I be the Yes. Yeah, so the one who's to know? talk now? Yes. All right. Well, I hope you'll all watch two marches. And at the end of two marches, I'm saying how at both marches, what was the same is that I felt completely safe in this huge crowded together crowd because we were all behaving so beautifully and being so kind to each other and acting as though, first I thought it was like we were all walking along as though we were pregnant, it, that you were carrying something inside you that nobody else could see, but it was more precious than you. And, and then I realized, well, I don't really want this image in the Women's March of everybody being pregnant. And that's when I thought of the, the little flame that you want to carry it so carefully so that nothing can blow it out. And I I, if, if Paul Robeson, I mean, if that's a good image, Paul Robeson had a very big flame inside himself that, that burned high enough to illuminate a great deal. And it was a great privilege to spend years of my life getting to know him better. So I guess that's, that's what I have to say. Oh, and about that flame, you know, I mean, it's so easy to put it out. If you let yourself do something or be talked into something that you kind of know is wrong, it's just like the way kids will smoke a cigarette or drink, you know, and it, it, <clears throat> I feel horrible. And then you can, it's easy enough the third or fourth time. Well, doing wrong is easy enough the third or fourth time. So don't do it. I mean, when you really feel the, uh, that impulse from that little flame that you should be supporting someone or helping someone or maybe calling a politician or walking in the street or giving away money, do it, do it. That's how you build your flame. That's how you make it bigger and brighter and are able to be guided by it. And that's what I have to say. Well, I would like to ask the audience if they have any other questions before we wrap up our interview. You can just drop it in the Q&A section of the chat. And while you wait, Taylor, what do you, how, how do you keep the tiny flame lit? Um, I think she summed it up perfectly. Um, well, in the beginning of this interview, when she said that we just need to organize, um, we have to come together. What I believe um, the government is trying to do is trying to, separate everyone, um, trying to have us argue amongst ourselves so that we can't defeat that bigger giant, which is them. Um, but I believe that if we all band together um, for the common good, that we'll be able to really accomplish some great things. And so what are you planning to study? When you, you, you mentioned that you are doing your college applications, tell us a little bit more. You didn't introduce yourself. <laughs> So I'm actually planning to study biochemistry um, with a focus in pre-med. Um, I just want to rev revolutionize the um, medical industry because of the decades of inequalities um, in the healthcare community. So I just want to encourage um, future generations um, of Black doctors and um, pretty much just for everybody to receive healthcare. And because of this um, healthcare inequality, we see, we see this today as well with COVID-19, um, the deaths just in urban communities are just extremely high and they are still extremely high. Um, and that's where my concern is. So, yeah. And I also want to, um, my, one of my other interests is political science as well. I'm really interested in um, politics and um, pretty much how the government oppresses people, unfortunately. Well, you know, this has been a delightful conversation. Sharon, it has been absolutely my joy to see your face. I've been listening to your voice and reading your words and being inspired by your gift. Taylor Faith, you again, you always manage to inspire me to and, and motivate me. You fill my cup. 
Both of you have filled my cup this evening. To those of you in the audience, thank you for joining us here for this conversation. And we look forward to designing programs at the Paul Robeson House in partnership with the library, with the Leaders of Color for Change at Princeton High School. And just, we want to spotlight this idea that all of us has a flame that we carry. And it takes nothing to transfer our light from one hand, one set of hands to the other. And so I thank you so much for your time tonight. I appreciate you, Sharon. I appreciate you, Taylor Faith. Thank you to the Princeton Public Library, Not In Our Town, and the Paul Robeson House Program Committee for your support in getting this program together tonight. Thank you very much and good night, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a wonderful evening, Thank everyone. You much. I hope we we'll see each other again. <laughs> yes, please. Yes, please. <laughs>